Quick answers to tough questions. And that title is cleverly taken from my book called Quick Answers to Tough Questions. You can see what I did there with that, right? And what we're going to do in this particular session is cover a bunch of these questions about origins and the age of the earth and evolution, etc., in very quick, concise fashion. We'll cover around 20 different questions. And please bear in mind, with each one of these questions, we could spend an entire session on each one of these individual questions. And in many cases, we do that. If you watch the other sessions, we've covered, we've done a whole session on Noah's Ark and the animals on Noah's Ark, and what about evolution, and what about the Big Bang, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But this session is meant to be just a fun uh, session where we give quick and concise answers, very ADD-friendly answers to all these sorts of questions. Now, in the book, I use the seven C's as my framework to go through those questions. Uh, for this format in this speaking presentation, I've done it like this. To give us a general flow for the questions we're going to cover. We'll cover first some foundational questions. Then we'll deal with some origins in the Earth's age question. We'll talk about evolution, Noah's Ark and flood, dinosaurs. We'll wrap up with some foundational questions. And then four hours later, we'll be done. No, just an hour, okay? They'll be very quick and very concise. So if you can just buckle up, hold on tight, uh, we're going to cover a lot of stuff in a relatively short amount of time. And let's start with maybe one of the most important questions of all. Still a couple of foundational questions. The first question is this, why? Why do all of this? Why do we believe from God's word that defending the faith and doing apologetics is so necessary and relevant in a day and age like ours? We think it's so important that we as a ministry have built the Creation Museum through God's power and provision and the Ark Encounter. We have literally thousands of resources on our website, at our bookstores. You can check those out. I'm sure some of you have already. We do conferences all around the world when there's not corona happening, right? And we literally travel all over the place proclaiming this truth. Why do we think this, so, this is so important? Well, in short, you've heard whole, whole talks on this. But in short, we're so passionate because we've recognized God's word is under attack. And we're seeing the, the consequences of that attack as we see the collapse of the Christian worldview in America, throughout the West, and throughout other nations around the world. And this is happening because God's word is under assault. And the fact that God's word is under attack, that's nothing new, right? It's been under attack since Genesis chapter 3. When the devil said to Eve, did God really say? And please notice what he was doing there. He was getting Eve to question God's word so she would doubt God's word. So ultimately, she would reject it. And we must be mindful of this. Why? Because the method he used on Eve is the same method he uses on us today. And one of the main ways he's doing this today in our modern era is through teaching of things like evolution and eight men and Big Bang and millions of years. He's using those sort of secular ideas to watch this, to get multiple generations to question God's word, doubt God's word, ultimately to reject it. Same fundamental attack. With one different stealth twist. Notice what he's doing today. Today, he's attacking the Bible's history to undermine the Bible's authority, to undermine the gospel based in that authority. Because bottom line is this, and this really does make sense. If you cannot believe the Bible's history, why on earth would you trust what it says about salvation? If you can't believe the beginning of this book, why would you trust the middle or the end? Either all of this book is authoritative and true or none of it is. And the gospel rests in the total authority of God's word. Ultimately, this is an authority of the Bible issue. It's an issue of the gospel as a result. And that's why we are so passionate about equipping believers to give a defense where the attack is happening today. And in short, that's why this stuff is so important. And then... Here's another fundamental question, a foundational one, that we'll come back to again and again, this basic principle. And that is this. Why such different views of the past? Why do biblical scientists and secular scientists have such different views about unseen history? And to answer the question, I'll actually ask a question. I'll ask you guys this. You can answer at home. Here's the question. When do fossils exist, past or present? Of course, the right answer is they exist in the present, right? If they did not, we would not have them. And we got, guys, we got to recognize that when you find a bone in the dirt, 
And you look at a rock layer, it doesn't come with a label on it saying, hey, I'm 65 million years old, made in China, or whatever, all right? We find a bone in the dirt, we know something has died, and that's really about it. But here's the point. All the evidence any scientist has, secular scientists, biblical scientists, watch this, they've got all the same stuff in the present. The same rock layers in the present, the same radioisotopes in the present, the same fossils in the present, the same distant starlight observed in the present. But guys, here's the key. They interpret those things differently in the present and make different guesses about where those things came from, their origin, and thus their age based on their different starting assumptions about the unseen past, based on their different worldviews, based on their different foundations, God's word versus man's. And here's the key. If you start with the wrong assumptions, you'll most likely get the wrong conclusions. And guys, this is why some really brilliant secular scientists can be so dead wrong about certain things like the age of the earth, rock layers, dinosaurs, etc. Wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. Reminded of the story of an elderly gentleman who was sure his wife was going deaf. So one night he snuck up behind her about 10 feet away and he whispered, can you hear me, honey? Nothing. He got a few feet closer. Can you hear me, honey? Nothing. He got right behind her. Can you hear me, honey? To which she responded, for the third time, yes. Wasn't her problem, right? Wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. And guys, this is why secular scientists are indeed so wrong about certain things. Because bottom line is this. They're trusting man's ideas over God's clear revealed word about history. Wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. Keep that thought in mind. We'll come back to it a whole bunch throughout the entire presentation. So with that foundation being laid, let's jump into some of the questions. Let's deal with some origins questions first. And here's a big one. And man, it's so relevant as we think about what's happening in our world today. The question is asked in many ways, but we'll word it like this for our purposes in this talk. It goes like this. And I think everybody asks this at some point in their life. Why would God, why would an all-good, all-knowing, all-powerful God make a world like the one we live in today that has so much death, suffering, cancer, disease, COVID-19, tsunamis, natural catastrophes? Why would he make a world like this, the one we live in today? And the short answer is, he didn't. If you know biblical history from the beginning, the Bible is clear that God originally, he made a very good creation. What's good to God other than perfection? Guys, he gave us what he wanted for us. He gave us perfection. And he warned Adam, the day you eat of the fruit, you will surely die. And guys, the Bible is clear throughout all of Scripture. We see it in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, Romans 5, 1 Corinthians 15, book of Revelation, etc. The Bible is clear that it was man's sin that brought death the enemy, death the intruder, into God's perfect creation. Man's sin brought death into this world. Man's sin corrupted the whole of creation with the curse and death. Romans 8, 22 says, For the whole of creation groans in pain. Why? Because of man's sin. And it desperately wants to be returned back to its perfect state, which it will be someday when Christ returns. The bottom line is our sin changed everything. And by the way, since we all descend from Adam, that's why we're all sinners by nature and consequently by choice. And that's why we all need saving through the last Adam, Jesus Christ. You see, both Adams are essential to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel begins in the book of Genesis, not in the book of Matthew. So with that being said, here's another very popular question we get today. Well, how old is the earth? Well, if you start with the Bible, this question really isn't that hard if we start from God's word and trust our thinking from there. If we stand on God's word, if we trust, think about it like this, if we trust the eyewitness account of the creator himself, Guys, the plain, straightforward reading of the biblical text is that God created in six days, roughly 6,000 years ago. And some will say, well, Brian, but where do you get that from? Where do you guys get that from? Does the Bible explicitly say the earth is 6,000 years old? And of course, it does not. But it gives us something better. It gives us a birth certificate of sorts, a way to calculate the earth's age based on the data we find in the Bible. Here's what I mean. We're talking about, in particular, those biblical family trees in the Bible. 
uh, those genealogies. So-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so. Those things you love to read at night if you're trying to go to sleep, right? They'll just knock you right out. Well, in some of those genealogies, it gives you the age of the father when he has his son. And then it gives the son age when it, son's age when he has his kid, and it keeps going down the line. And you can add those ages up. It's not that hard to do to get a good general age for the earth. So doing that, we know from Adam to Abraham, 2,000 years, roughly. From Abraham to Jesus, roughly 2,000 years. And then from Jesus to today is roughly 2,000 years. Put that all together, the earth is around 6,000 years of age. Or put another way, God made everything around 4,000 B.C. Now, we don't think you can be exact and say 4,004 B.C. at 8 o'clock in the morning. Right? We do know that Adam was made in the afternoon because it was just before Eve. But other than that, you can't be dogmatic. And some would say, oh, okay, Brian, well, well, that makes sense. But then wait a minute. How do you know that those days in Genesis are regular 24-hour days? Well, that's a good and fair question. There's a good and clear answer. And in a word, the answer is exegesis. And this is how we're supposed to read the Bible, exegetically. This means to read out of. It means you read a text in its context because context determines meaning. That's a common function of language. So when does the word day in the Old Testament uh, mean a regular 24-hour day? Because if we're going to read the word day in context, what does the word day mean in Genesis chapter 1 based on the context? Because the word day does have multiple meanings. No informed, rational person argues against that. One example, this one sentence. Back in my father's day, it took 10 days to drive across America during the day. You got the word day three different times in one sentence. And it means something different each time it's used, and you know it does, based on the context. Context determines meaning. That's pretty clear throughout languages, period. So here's the question. When does the context in the Old Testament always demand that the word day be understood as a literal 24-hour day? Well, watch this. Anytime we see any one of these contextual clues just one time, guys, it's always a literal 24-hour day. So anytime you see the word day, it's accompanied by a number over 400 times. It always means a literal 24-hour day, like when it says on the first day or during the second day. Or, or actually and, every time you see the word day with the phrase evening and morning, even that phrase evening and morning without the word day, it always in the Old Testament refers to a literal 24-hour day. And then anytime you see the word night with day over 52 times, it's always a literal 24-hour day. So when does the word day mean a regular day? Anytime you see one, just one, of these contextual clues, just one time, it's always a literal 24-hour day. So we do know when the word day means a regular day based on these contextual clues. So here's the question. How is it written in Genesis chapter 1? Is the context clear or unclear? Well, I'll let you decide for yourself. Remember these clues, and let's look at Genesis chapter 1, days of creation. Ready? 1, chapter 1, verse 5. The darkness he called night, so the evening and the morning were the first day. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Notice for every day of creation, evening, morning, number, day, evening, morning, number, day, evening, morning, number, day, evening, morning, number, day. I'm noticing a theme there, right? The context is really, really clear. Guys, literally, it is contextual overkill. It's an overemphasis. It's like God knew we would struggle with this later on, right? He is helping us out, giving us multiple clues in the context. These are regular 24-hour days. Plus, There are lots of really good Hebrew words that mean an indefinite period of time. If that's what God wanted to tell us, he used none of those. He used the word day, based on the context, a literal 24-hour day. And guys, this idea is reaffirmed throughout Scripture. The best commentary on the Bible is the Bible, right? Exodus 20, verse 11. For in six, what? Days, the Lord made heaven, the earth, the sea, and how much? All that is in them. The text is really, really clear. And then that leads to another really good question. And it's a fair question. People say, okay, Brian, okay, answers in Genesis. So what? Who cares? Why shouldn't Christians believe in millions of years? And guys, there are lots of reasons Christians should not believe in millions of years to try to squeeze that into the Bible. First of all, the text and grammatical structure of Genesis does not allow for millions of years. And here's the thing. Can we trust what this book plainly says in context? 
And if you can't trust it in one place, why trust it in another? Either it's all true or none of it is. Guys, the evidence rightly understood does not allow for millions of years. We'll see more of that later on. But guys, most importantly of all, please watch this. The Bible's theology, and indirectly the gospel, does not allow for millions of years. You say, what do you mean? Well, follow through on this. You see, the Bible is clear, as we mentioned earlier, that God made a perfect creation, but man's sin, through man's action, sin came into the world, and death came as a consequence of man's sin. Death is an enemy. Death is an intruder brought about by the sin of man. But here's the problem. If we try to squeeze millions of years into the Bible, no matter how you try, you'll put millions of years of death before sin. And death before sin is theologically impossible for a whole bunch of reasons. Here are a few quick ones. First, in Genesis 1, in verse 29, God told Adam and Eve they were to eat fruit. The animals were to eat plants. In verse 30, originally in the perfect creation, all things were vegetarian, which I know sounds kind of weird to us today, but makes really good biblical sense because there was no death in this world until after Adam sinned, which means you cannot eat meat until after he sinned. Because when we eat meat, we're eating an animal that has died. Before sin, no death, everything has to be vegetarian. Not until after the flood that God told Noah, just as I gave you plants to eat, now you can eat everything. And that's why it's okay to eat filet mignon wrapped in bacon today. We had that permission post-flood. But why is this a problem? Here's why. If we reject the clear biblical teaching that God made a perfect creation, but then man sinned, bringing death and suffering into this world, and then there was a global flood that laid down most of the rock layers and fossils we see today. If you reject that, and you instead embrace the secular idea, the atheistic idea, that the rock layers and fossils were laid down slowly over millions of years before man ever existed, and thus before sin, and those rock layers supposedly laid down before man, before sin, we find lots of evidence of animals eating each other. Lots of it. But the Bible says before man sinned, all things were vegetarian. We find in the same fossil record, so many diseases, brain tumors, cancer, and arthritis, and many others. But before man sinned? The Bible says God looked down on day six before man sinned and called everything very good. Surely he would not call millions of years of death, suffering, bloodshed, cancer, diseases very good. If he did, he's not a very good God. And by the way, if this were true, think about it. It makes God the author of death. It was part of his original very good creation. Not only that, if this were true, evidently he used millions of years of death as part of his creative molding process for creation. Guys, that's not the biblical God. That would be an ogre of a God, not the biblical God. We find thorns in the fossil record, supposedly millions of years old. But guys, the Bible is clear. Thorns came after the curse. They're a result of the curse. They're a symbol of the curse. And that's why Christ on the cross, he wore the crown of what? thorns that we just talked about not too long ago. He bore the curse on our behalf. He became a curse for us. And then here's a big deal. If you try to squeeze millions of years into the Bible, no matter how you try, you put death before sin. doesn't matter how you try. Day age theory, gap theory, progressive creation, theistic evolution, framework hypothesis, does not matter. They all put death before sin. And watch this logically and theologically. If there's death before sin, then death is not the consequence or the payment for sin. Just always been around, part of God's very good creation. And if death is not the payment for sin, then Jesus' death does not, cannot pay our sin debt. And we just destroyed the foundation for the gospel, whether we meant to or not, which we just celebrated with Easter not too long ago. And at best, if this were true, at best, it makes this event in history unnecessary. And guys, can I tell you something? This is why we care so much. Our passion is in ministry. It's not about winning a debate about the age of the earth or dinosaurs or rockets, but rather our passion is about defending biblical authority and the gospel that rests in that authority because, guys, ultimately, that's what's under attack. That's what's at stake, and that's why this matters so much. Again, the gospel doesn't begin in the book of Matthew. It begins in the book of Genesis. It truly does. And some will say, okay, Brian, well, that makes sense, but then wait a minute. 
Haven't they, they, the scientists, secular scientists, proven millions of years with things like radiometric dating? And the short answer is no. Guys, please bear in mind, you cannot scientifically prove millions of years. Why? Because you cannot observe millions of years in a laboratory. They cannot be repeated in a laboratory through an experiment. And also notice, things like rock layers and things like isotopes, they don't come with labels on them. You must interpret them in the present to make a guess about their origin and age. So with that in mind, let's kind of summarize isotope dating and we'll get to the problems of it. So what is it? Well, basically, there are these isotopes in our world that are unstable. They'll change from one to another. Like certain types of uranium will change into lead. And we can measure how fast this happens in the present. We can watch it and measure it as it changes into lead. And we can measure how fast this occurs. That is called the rate of decay. And we observe that in the present. And then we can also measure the ratio of isotopes in a piece of rock, in a material, to measure how much of, one, how much of the uranium is in the rock, how much of the lead is in the rock. So we can measure the ratios. And then we can take the ratios of the isotopes in the rock, divide that by the rate of decay, to make a guess about the age of the rock. That's a big picture perspective on the process. But again, keeping the big picture, guys, notice something very important. When do you measure the rate of decay, past or present? Of course, that's done in the present. When do we measure the ratio of isotopes in the sample, past or present? That's done in the present. And then when do we do our calculations about those isotopes and the rate of decay to make a guess about the age that's done in the present. It's all done in the present, in the present, in the present through a set of assumptions about the unseen past based on a foundational worldview. Either you trust God's word or man's. Those are your only two rational foundations. And guys, the seculars are so wrong because their starting foundational assumptions are so wrong. Please get this. Before the seculars even engage the evidence, before they even look at the isotopes, they assume the Bible is wrong. That the Bible's clear history about a supernatural creation and a global flood around 4,500 years ago, that that's not real history, that this book is wrong. Therefore, notice, they're not being neutral. They're assuming you can and must explain all observations with only natural processes. That's the religion of naturalism, materialism, essentially atheism. They have a religious worldview. Everybody does. It's impossible not to. Therefore, they're not being neutral. They're pushing their own ideology, and they're assuming the Bible's wrong. And so, no wonder their conclusions are so wrong, guys. Their starting assumptions about history are so wrong. So, even if something like radiometric dating uh, worked perfectly, it would not prove millions of years because of the faulty secular assumptions that drive their wrong interpretations. But guys, it's the opposite of perfect. A few quick examples of this, looking at different methods. Using carbon-14 dating. Part of a mammoth was dated to be 29,000 years old. Another part of the same mammoth was dated to be 44,000 years old. Now, that would be a very slow birth, right? Poor mammoth mother. We've dated freshly killed seals with carbon-14 dating to be over 1,300 years of age. Guys, that's off by more than a thousand percent. So we're not even close here. Or using other dating methods like potassium argon dating. This one's often used to date igneous rocks. That's lava flows that have cooled and turned into stone. And this one's a really good one to test. Why? Well, because we know when in history certain lava flows occurred when they cooled and turned into stone. So we can date those rocks of historical known age with the method to see if the method is somewhat accurate. And I could give you hundreds of examples. Here's just a couple quick ones for the sake of time. Rocks that formed back in 1972 were dated with potassium argon dating to be 200 to almost 500,000 years of age. Actual known age of the rocks was around 30 when they were dated. Rocks that formed back in New Zealand back in 1954 were dated between 3.3 and 3.7 million years old. Actual known age was about 50 when they were dated. Rocks that formed in Hawaii back in 1959 were dated between 1 and 15 million years of age. And guys, please notice the huge margin of error. And none of those dates are close to the actual known age of around 40 when the rocks were dated. And we could just go on and on and on. 
It shows kind of the inconsistencies of the method, show the inconsistency of their starting assumptions about the unseen past. And someone say, okay, but then what about carbon-14 dating? Hasn't that proved the Earth is millions of years old? I've been told that my entire life, well, what some would say. Well, ironically, here's the thing. Carbon-14, it's one of the best evidences of a young Earth. You say, really? That's yeah, pretty cool. Check this out. So carbon-14 forms an atmosphere, and it is an unstable element. It'll change it to nitrogen-14 uh, fairly quickly by radiometric standards. And then here's what happens. The carbon-14... It gets absorbed by plants. Animals eat plants. We eat animals and plants, so all living things contain some carbon-14 inside of them. And remember, the carbon-14 is unstable. But actually, all of you watching out there, you have some carbon-14 inside of you. That means all of you are slightly unstable, <laughs> so, especially during this quarantine, right? <laughs> but here's what happens. When a creature dies, it stops taking in carbon-14. And the carbon-14 it does have starts to decay back to nitrogen-14. Now, here's the key. The carbon-14 decays so quickly that within 100,000 years after the creature's death, there should be no detectable carbon-14. So, scientifically speaking, anything over 100,000 years of age should have no detectable carbon-14. So this is another really good test. What do we find again and again and again in pretty much all organic remnants in all the rock layers top to bottom? Watch this. We find large amounts of carbon-14 in pretty much all of those remnants from top to bottom at similar levels. We find carbon-14 in coal seams all the time, upper, middle, lower coal seams. We find carbon-14 in dinosaur bones all the time. We find carbon-14 in diamonds. Now, that really blows the secular's mind because diamonds are thought to be billions of years old and there is no way to contaminate a diamond. How is carbon-14 still inside? Right answer, they're just not that old, as the Bible clearly implies from the beginning. And then one last one about the age of the earth, and we'll move away from this issue, I promise. All right, but a lot of questions here. So one last one. What about distant starlight? Hasn't that conclusively proved the earth is billions of years old? And if you're not familiar with the argument, it goes a little something like this, that there are these stars or astronomical bodies out in space that are so far away from us that it will take light, even moving 186,000 miles per second, it will take light billions of years to get from that star to the earth so we could see it. The argument continues. We can indeed see light from that star. That means, they'll say, there must have been billions of years to give that light time to travel from the star to the earth so we could see it. That's the general argument. And guys, here's the thing. One might conclude that that observation in the present proves millions of years. Watch this. If you start with the assumption, you must explain this observation with only natural processes. Guys, think with me biblically here for a second. Creation week. Was that a natural event or supernatural event? What's the answer? Supernatural, right? Does it get more supernatural than God speaking? And by the mere power of his word, God creates everything. Creation ex nihilo, creation out of nothing. He speaks every molecule into existence. He makes everything by the mere power of his word. Why? Because he is God. That's why. He's not a superhero. He's not Superman or Thor, some elevated human. He is beyond us. He is holy, 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 all-knowing, all-powerful, everywhere existing, everywhere present, beyond time. He made time. He is God. That's why he can speak the world into existence. And it says multiple times in Genesis chapter 1, and God said, and it was so. And God said, and it was so. And for day four, when he made the sun, moon, and the stars, he said, let there be light in the expanse to give that light upon the earth for signs and for seasons, to shine upon the earth, and it was so. He created them to shine on the earth, and the light got from the star to the earth pretty much immediately. And some will push back and say, but wait a minute, Brian. I mean, that would be a miracle. Yes! <laughs> That's the biblical point of the creation account. It's a supernatural event. It's showing us God's miraculous power because he is God. Now think about it. Logically, theologically, biblically, 
Is it any problem at all for an all-knowing, all-powerful God to get distance light from a star to the earth immediately any way he wants? Is that a problem for him? Not at all, right? When Jesus changed the water into wine, that didn't take tens or hundreds of years. He did it immediately. When Jesus healed, he could do so immediately. God creates by his power any way he wants. And the scripture records for us, he did it immediately by the power of his word. And some will say, okay, Brian, well, that makes sense, but then hold up. If you do that, if you say that, then aren't you appealing to a God of the gaps argument? That there's some deity out there that we can't really know, and we can't know how he did it, we just can't understand, we just can't know, so don't worry about it. That's not what we're doing at all. Notice what we are doing. Guys, we're appealing to the God of the Bible who told us what he did in his word. The question is, do we believe it? Whose word do we trust? Man's or God's? And by the way, there are lots of really good uh, scientists out there, biblical scientists standing on God's word. who are looking at how God may have done this and maybe uh, some sort of natural way, using natural laws in a unique, unique way to get the light from the stars to the earth quickly. And God could have used natural laws. It could have been totally supernatural. Here's the point. Either way, not a problem for the biblical God. And then here's what's so ironic about this particular question that's thrown out as a, thrown out as a gauntlet so many times. In actuality, do you know who has the actual uh, distant starlight problem? The secularists, those who believe in the Big Bang, have the real distant starlight problem. It's called the horizon problem. Do more research later on if you would like. But here it is in a nutshell. In the Big Bang model, there's not been enough time, even in 14 billion years, to get light across the entire universe, which must have happened for numerous reasons. So how do they explain that conundrum? It's a distant starlight time travel problem. Same thing for them. How do they explain it away? Here's what the secularists suggest today. That after the Big Bang, essentially when nothing exploded and produced everything, after that, there began something called inflation. Or for some unknown reason, by some unknown mechanism, time, space, and matter began to expand exponentially faster than the speed of light. And did so for a while, for some unknown reason, by some unknown mechanism. And then after a while, it stopped this rapid expansion, for some unknown reason, by some unknown mechanism. And then began today's normal operational rates, by some unknown reason, by some unknown mechanism. You see where I'm going with this. Guys, see what the seculars are doing? They're appealing to unknown mechanisms, unnatural processes, to save their naturalistic theory, inherently inconsistent and self-contradictory. Guys, as Christians, we don't have a distant starlight problem. Ironically, the secularists do. You can answer those questions. You can defend your faith. Stand boldly on God's word. But moving on from these age of the earth issues, what about things like evolution? Don't we see animals evolving? Well, define your terms. What do you mean by evolving? Do we see animals changing like this from one kind to another? Like something like a crocodile duck? or something like that. And of course not. But do we see animals change? Of course, the answer is yes, animals do change. And the type of change we actually observe again and again confirms what we read in God's word, where it says over 10 times in Genesis, Genesis 1, or implies 10 times, that God made distinct kinds of plants and animals to reproduce according to their kinds. And the word kind, if we talked about numerous times now, is equal to about the family level of modern day classification. So, According to the Bible, God made the dog kind, and dogs make variations of dogs. Cats make variations of cats, unfortunately. Just kidding, all right? We've watched pepper moss evolve for 150 years, and they've evolved into, guess what? Moths. We've watched Darwin's finches evolve for over 150 years, and they've evolved into, guess what? Finches. And guys, what did Darwin observe on the Galapagos Islands? He saw finches with small beaks, medium beaks, and large beaks. Guys, there are people watching from all over the world with small beaks, medium beaks, and large beaks. You're all still humans, just variation within the kind, like the Bible clearly teaches and implies from the beginning. And so what causes these variations today in our Genesis 3 fallen, sin-cursed world? Two main things, natural selection and mutations. These things are real and they cause variation in our broken, sin, cursed world. No doubt about that. But here's the question, big picture, concise answer. Can natural selection and mutations lead to what some will call 
macro evolution, Darwinian evolution, molecules to man evolution, fish to philosopher evolution, rock to rock star evolution. Can they lead to that? And the short answer is no. Why? Because they do not add any new, brand new genetic information that leads to evolutionary traits being developed over time. Natural selection and mutations essentially shuffle existing genetic information and tend to lose it over time, not gain it. Give you a practical example. Let's say you get two dogs who get off Noah's Ark, and they have kids, and their kids have kids, and their kids have kids, and you end with a whole bunch of dogs. Population builds up, population spreads out, and different combinations of genes survive better in different environments. And let's say the initial parents for this population have genetic information for S, short hair, and L, long hair. Of course, it is more complicated than this, but the principles do hold true. So these parents can make multiple variations, right? They could pass on both short hair genes and make dogs with really short hair, pass on one of each and make dogs with medium hair, like them, or pass on both long hair genes and create a really hairy dog. Pretty simple, right? Let's say a segment of this population with those different variations goes up north where it is cold. Well, in that cold environment, the dogs with short hair and medium hair, they'll get cold, they'll freeze, and then they will die. If that makes you sad, they could move away, right? Whatever works for you. But after a while, in that cold environment, all you have is dogs with long hair, which on their own only produce dogs with long hair. That is natural selection and most likely mutations in action. Now notice through that process, did you add or lose genetic information? You actually lost it, right? You lost information for short hair. You actually lose a variation, not gaining. It's going in the wrong direction for Darwinian evolution. And through this process, you get tons of variations of dogs. But notice they are dogs like God made them to be, past, present, and future. And even most secular scientists would agree with that, but they'll say, but there is something that does add the new information we need to change a dog into a cat or a rock into a rock star, give it enough time. What is that magic ingredient besides time? Something they'll call mutations. And mutations are, of course, real. But what is a mutation? You think they're pretty awesome from a secular perspective, right? You might be surprised to know that mutations are when genetic information is randomly damaged or changed. Guys, they're rare, mostly harmful. Very often they are lethal. Why? Because they're accidents in your genome. They're typos in your DNA. And accidents tend to mess things up, not make it better. What do mutations do in the real world from real observations in real science? Here's what they do. They rearrange or delete existing genetic information. Watch this. They do not add it. They just mess up what's already there, put there originally by the creator. As this secular scientist says, not even one mutation has been observed that adds a little information. Indeed, all mutations studied, observed, think operational science, they destroy information. None can serve as an example that lead to macro-Darwinian evolution. And this is a devastating argument against even the plausibility of Darwinian evolution. And I want you to hear how the evolutionist responds. I want to show you a little clip of a guy named Richard Dawkins. You might recognize that name. He's probably the world's most famous atheist at this time. He's an evolutionary biologist. He's a smart man, not dumb. He's a smart man, but he's trusting the wrong foundation, man's word over God's. And he was once asked by a journalist to give one example of a mutation that adds brand new genetic information. And guys, I don't often agree with an atheist, but I think he nails it this time. Listen to what he says in response to the question. Can you give an example of a genetic mutation or, 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 or an evolutionary process which ha can be seen to increase the information in the genome? Now, of course, the only thing I added to the video was the music. That's it. But he does not give an answer at all. 
Why? Not because he's dumb. He's not. He's a very smart man. But because there's not a good example of a mutation that adds brand new specified information, genetically speaking, to make macroevolution even genetically possible. So in short, all we ever observe with natural selection and mutations are new combinations of already existing genetic information with less variability than they started with. No brand new information. That's the opposite of what you would have to have for Darwinian macro evolution. Real science, biology, genetics confirms the Bible again and again. And someone would say, okay, but then what about those ape men that we see in textbooks? We see the specials on Discovery Channel, National Geographic. We go to zoos and museums. We see them all over the place. Doesn't that prove evolution? Well, again, bear in mind, the evidence must be interpreted in the present with a worldview, a set of guesses about the unseen past built on the foundational foundation, which is either God's word or man's. And again, wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. And there are basically three different ways that secularists wrongly interpret present-day data to conclude an ape man. Here they are. Way number one. They find some ape bones and dress them up like a human and create a so-called ape man. Or they find fragments of human bones, dress those up like an ape and make an ape man. Or find human bones and ape bones, wrongly put them together and create an ape man. All based on imagination, all based, all based on interpretation within a worldview about the, which is based on assumptions about the unseen past. And again, wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. As this secular scientist says, Everybody knows fossils are fickle. Bones will sing any song you want to hear. And that's especially true of these so-called hominids, these ape men. A few examples of this. Lucy, Australopithecines afarensis for a long time, thought to be one of the best evidences of uh, evolutionary, human evolution from apes to humans. They found 25% of her total fossil. They found no hand bones, no foot bones. Later on, they found some relatives of Lucy, they found uh, their hand bones and foot bones. And guys, the bones of Lucy and her relatives are all similar to that of a modern day chimp. Chimp-like long arms, chimp-like curved fingers, chimp-like short legs, chimp-like feet, big toe out to the side, chimp-like hips, chimp-like shoulders, chimp-like head, chimp-like everything. Yet, despite all those, those facts, here's how Lucy is typically displayed in museums around the world. Standing upright with a human gait, walking like a human, Long human-like legs, short human-like arms, human-like hands, human-like feet, staring off into the distance like, where am I going in life? Right now, nowhere you're under quarantine. Right? But that doesn't line up with the facts at all. But it does line up with their worldview. Or, Artipithecus ramidus. It took them 15 years to sort out that mess. And from that mess, they created Artie. And already got her own Discovery Channel special where they used some really good CGI to kind of put her back together to walk upright like a human. And uh, really was very convincing if you just watched the video that all oh, this must be true. And she definitely was a hominid. Eight men must be true. Convincing so many people, especially younger generations, that evolution must be true as a proven fact. And by the way, again, if evolution is true, then the Bible's clear history is false. If the Bible's history is false, why trust it about anything else? Or Nebraska man. What did they have for Nebraska man? They had one tooth for Nebraska man. It's a tooth from three different angles. It was one tooth. They had, they had a tooth, the whole tooth, and nothing but the tooth. And you can't handle the tooth. I've got to get all those out at one fell swoop. I'm sorry to my bride. She hates it when I do that. But anyway, right? throwing it all out there. But from that one tooth, they drew not only Nebraska man, they drew also his wife from that one tooth, which is really impressive reasoning, right? Or maybe not impressive reasoning, but they drew it all from the one tooth. They kept digging in the dirt and found more belongs, belongs to that particular tooth. Turns out that tooth did not belong to a person or ape at all. That tooth belonged to an extinct variation of pig. And that is the first time in history that a pig made a monkey of a man. <laughs> or a Piltdown Man. For a Piltdown Man, what was presented as evidence was a skull cap and a jawbone. Now, what they wore in reality, they were actually, it was actually a deliberate hoax. The skull cap was a human skull cap, the jawbone, an ape jawbone. But someone took them, put them together, filed down the teeth of the jawbone, stained the fragments the same color, then presented them as proof of evolution as a deliberate fraud. Guys, Piltdown Man was used in textbooks for over 40 years as proof for evolution, convincing so many generations 
Well, the Bible's history must not be true, but a deliberate hoax. But it was in, but it was in textbooks for 40 years. And to come back to Lucy very quickly, what about Lucy? I want to bring out something very important about her that really shows the worldview issue at play here. You see, Lucy, as I mentioned before, her bones similar to that of a chimps, including her hips. Guys, her hips are angled in such a way that Lucy most likely walked on all fours like chimps today, could waddle on two legs and go back to all fours like chimps today. But her discoverers did not like that, and it did not fit their worldview, their starting assumptions. So I want you to see what a team of scientists did, only one is shown in the video, to make the evidence fit their preconceived ideas. And as you watch this video, please bear in mind, they're brilliant people, especially in their fields. But what this video really does show, it shows the power of your worldview, the power of your starting assumptions to dictate your conclusions, to fit your preconceived ideas. Check this out. The eight that stood up, it was a revolutionary idea. We needed Owen Lovejoy's expertise again, because the evidence wasn't quite adding up. The knee looked human, but the shape of her hip didn't. Superficially, her hip resembled a chimpanzee's, which meant that Lucy couldn't possibly have walked like a modern human. But Lovejoy noticed something odd about the way the bones had been fossilized. When I put the two parts of the pelvis together that we had, this part of the pelvis has pressed so hard and so completely into this one that it caused it to be broken into a series of individual pieces which were then fused together in later fossilization. After Lucy died, some of her bones lying in the mud must have been crushed or broken, perhaps by animals browsing at the lake shore. Uh, this has caused the two bones, in fact, to fit together so well that they are in an anatomically impossible position. The perfect fit was an illusion that made Lucy's hip bones seem to flare out like a chimp's. Okay, one quick interruption. Notice the original ape-like perfect fit. It was an illusion to them. Why? It did not fit their starting assumptions about what they were looking at. Now watch what they do to make it fit their worldview. But all was not lost. Lovejoy decided he could restore the pelvis to its natural shape. He didn't want to tamper with the original, so he made a copy in plaster. He cut the damaged pieces out and put them back together the way they were before Lucy died. It was a tricky job, but after taking the kink out of the pelvis, it all fit together perfectly, like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. As a result, the angle of the hip looks nothing like a chimp's, but a lot like ours. You think? You know, keep grinding it down. You can make it look like whatever you want it to look like. And again, guys, it just shows the power of your worldview. That's really the main issue here, ultimately. What, foundational, uh, what foundation do you trust? God's word and what he says about the past or man's ideas. That being said, if we don't come from the ape man and we, call, and we all are, come from Adam and Eve, a very logical question is this which Avery will expound on more tomorrow during this time, but how do you explain all the diverse people groups if we all come from Adam and Eve? And guys, the Bible is so clear on this that all people, think about it, every person who's ever lived can trace their family tree, their origin, back to one man, one woman, Adam and Eve. That means, biblically speaking, how many races are there? That's right, one, the human race. But since that's true, but how do we explain the diversity within humanity if that's true? And it is. How do we explain things like different colors of skin if we all come from Adam and Eve? And we'll just pick this one trait for the sake of time. But are we really different colors? Let's word the question correctly. Are we different colors or are we different shades? Are we really red, yellow, black, and white? Like the kid's song says. And of course, my question to you is, am I white? Or, or let me clarify the question. Am I white like the background around my face in this particular picture? 
And of course, the answer is no. If I'm that color white, you should call an ambulance to help me out because I'm dying or dead, all right? I'm a lighter shade of brown. The guy labeled black, he's not black. He's a darker shade of brown. You realize that scientifically speaking, essentially all people on planet Earth, we are the same color, brown. We're just different shades. And it's mostly based on a pigment called melanin, which is a brown pigment in your skin. If you have more of that pigment, you're darker shade brown. Less of that pigment, you're lighter shade brown. Guys, we're all the same color, just different shades. How awesome is that? I'm going to say, okay, Brian, well, that makes sense, but then wait a minute. How come certain people groups only produce one particular shade today? Like darker shades to darker shades and lighter shades to lighter shades. Why does that happen? Well, to explain that, we would need an event in human history where the human gene pool got split up into isolated genetic pools in different places. Where in those different genetic pools in different places, different traits become dominant and take over the population. Do we have an event that will do that very well for us? The answer, of course, is yes. The Tower of Babel is a great answer to that particular question. At that particular time, this created isolated genetic pools. These genetic pools are isolated for at least two major reasons. They're isolated geographically. You've just been moved or moved to a brand new region. And there are no planes, trains, or automobiles. You'll stay in that particular area. And they're isolated, maybe more importantly, linguistically. You just got a brand new language. You're stick with the people who speak your own language. This creates isolated genetic pools where different traits become dominant over time and take over the population in those different areas. And guys, it would make really good sense that God put inside of Adam and Eve all the genetic diversity necessary to produce multiple variations even in one generation. Some say, okay, that's really neat, but is that even genetically possible? We still see this today when the information is available from the parents, genetically speaking. A few quick examples of that. <clears throat> Here's a set of biological twins. And you heard correctly, biological twins. The mother Jamaican, the father German. Now, someone did ask me one time if those are identical twins, and I just let it go, all right? Here's another set of biological twins, beautiful variation in one generation. And guys, notice the parents, a nice middle brown, like the majority of the world's population, and probably similar to the skin shade of Adam and Eve. Look at these two sets of twins from the same parents, tons of variation in one generation, Speaking of variation, look at the hair here of these Australian Aboriginal peoples. That is their real blonde, red, wavy hair. Pretty wild, right? Tons of variation possible, uh, especially from the beginning. And guys, real science, real genetics is confirming that we all go back to one man and one woman again and again, for example. And some of the most recent genetic studies, it's been found out that the difference between any two people on planet Earth, me, any of you watching, me and someone in Russia or China or Malaysia or Australia or Latin America, the difference between any two people on planet Earth is 0.1% of your DNA. Put another way, every person on planet Earth is essentially 99.9% .9 genetically identical. Guys, there is just one race, the human race. And then what about Noah's Ark and Flood? A couple of quick answers to these particular questions. I had a whole talk yesterday on this. That was so well done, but a short answer to that. How did Noah get all the animals onto the ark? Well, as we mentioned in the talk yesterday, go back and watch that full video if you get a chance. Noah's Ark was a huge ship, over 500 feet long and 85 feet wide and 50 feet tall with three different levels, literally a floating warehouse. Guys, please, let's recognize this. This is not Noah's Ark. An overloaded bathtub, how it's always presented so often in our kids' books and, and in many of our churches. Which, by the way, showing the ark like this depicts it as a fairy tale, not real history. And that's what the world says about it. Let's not reinforce the world's teaching. Let's reinforce the biblical teaching. It was a real ship. It was really big. Also, the Bible's clear. Noah took two of each kind onto the ark. Now, two of each species. And God says this again and again and again. He's, being, he's making a point here. Two of each kind. So practically speaking, that means Noah did not take 400 pairs of dogs on the ark. He most likely never saw a chihuahua or a poodle in his life. <laughs> he was a very blessed man. 
<laughs> he took two of the dog kind, two of the elephant kind, two of the cat kind, etc., etc. How many kinds would he need in total on the ark? And guys, in a worst case scenario, he would need roughly 1,400 total kinds. And in a worst, worst case scenario, he would need roughly 6,700 individual animals on that ark to account for all the variation we see today. Now, does that number include dinosaurs? Well, I'll give you a hint. The answer is not no. We'll come back to that here in a moment, though. And some say, but okay, but it doesn't take a long time, millions of years, to make rock layers. Not at all. Water, dirt, minerals, right conditions, you can make rock layers really quickly. A few recent examples in nature. Here's a ship's bell in case to buy rock. Here's a clock in a rock. Here's a spark plug in a rock. Those are not millions of years old. Or Mount St. Helens erupted back in 1980. From that minor eruption by historical standards, it produced rock layers, hundreds of rock layers in hours. It produced canyons like this one called or nicknamed the Mini Grand Canyon because it's 140th the size of the Grand Canyon with similar features to the Grand Canyon. And guys that formed that canyon, get this, in nine hours. We just watched it happen. Great observable, testable evidence. It doesn't take a long time to make those sort of structures. Rather, you need a catastrophe. And if you want bigger rock layers and bigger canyons, you will need a bigger catastrophe, maybe like a global flood mentioned in God's Word, Genesis 6 through 9. Some would say, okay, but doesn't it take a long time to make fossils? Not at all. Typically, fossils, they're evidence of a rapid process. You've got to bury something deeply and quickly to protect it from scavengers and decomposition. Few examples of this rapid process. Here's a petrified ham, a ham that turned to stone in less than 60 years after being buried. We don't know what to do with it, but there it is, a petrified ham. Here's a fish, fossilized in the act of eating another fish. This was pretty much instantaneous. This poor guy did not get to finish his last meal. And that's why I call this fossil the Last Supper. Or here's an ichthyosaur, fossilized in the act of giving birth, which does not take millions of years. Again, this was pretty much instantaneous. And recently in a laboratory, scientists made fossils in a lab in 24 hours. The fossils made in the lab look pretty much identical to fossils found out in nature. They did it with heat, pressure, and water. And guys, if there was a global flood that happened in accordance to God's word, we would expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. And that is exactly what we find. Great confirmation of the historicity of God's word. And as we begin to wrap, wrap up here, what about dinosaurs? Quickly, briefly, from a biblical perspective, a short answer on that. What about the dinosaurs? Well, to start off, we know dinosaurs were made on day six because land animals were made on day six, and that's what dinosaurs are. Why don't we find the word dinosaur in the Bible? Well, because it's a new word. Not invented until 1841 by Sir Richard Owen. It means terrible lizard. It was not used much until the early 1900s. So, of course, we do not expect to find the word dinosaur in older English translations of the Bible. The word was not even invented yet. But there's another word in older English translations before evolution became popular that appears to, in many cases, describe known various types of dinosaurs. And that word is dragon, translated from the Hebrew word tanim. Now, tanim is more broad than dinosaur, but it includes the dinosaur kind in its broader definition. What did dinosaurs originally eat, including the T-Rex? Well, originally, before man sinned, all things were vegetarian. Some say, what about those big old teeth? Well, sharp teeth can break into all sorts of things, including cantaloupes, pineapples, watermelons, etc. All things are vegetarian before man's sin. But then after man's sin, guys, man's sin changed everything. We tend to downplay the consequences of sin. Guys, sin changed the universe. It changed people. It changed animals. It changed the dirt. It changed the diets of animals. It changed everything. So diets for many animals changed after the fall of man, including some dinosaurs. Were dinosaurs on the ark? The short answer is yes. Pairs of all the air-breathing, uh, air land-dwelling animals entered the ark. That would include dinosaurs. And some will say, okay, Brian, I mean, the ark was big, but big enough for dinosaurs? Weren't there hundreds or thousands of variations of dinosaurs? Well, just like there are lots of variations of the dog kind, but just the one kind. Lots of variations of the horse kind, but just the one kind. Similar thing with dinosaurs. There are many variations of the Ceratopsia kind, but just the singular kind. 
There are lots of variations of the sauropod kind, but just the basic kind. There are around 60 to at most 80 some dinosaur kinds. Multiply by two, not that many needed on the ark. And some will say, okay, Brian, not that many needed on the ark, but are you serious right now? <laughs> and that leads to a very common misconception. You realize that the average size of a dinosaur was equal to that of a bison, like a really big cow. And some were as small as chickens. It's true. Now, if those were still around today, we could eat some good old KFD. <laughs> but as it turns out, we know that all dinosaurs started small. You say, how do you know all? Because they hatched from eggs. And the biggest neck can get for a whole bunch of reasons is about the size of a football. So all dinosaurs started off about this big, including T-Rex, uh, your Seismosaurus, Diplodocus, Tyrachosaurus, whichever one you want, Cyracosaurus, all of them start about the size of a football. And we see a similar thing today with crocodiles and alligators. Start small, they get big over time. And it would make sense that God brought to uh, Noah young adults of all the animals, especially the bigger ones like dinosaurs. And they are included in that number we showed you earlier. And some will say, okay, but if dinosaurs lived just 6,000 years ago and many died during the flood, then shouldn't we find some tangible evidence of dinosaurs dying in the flood roughly 4,500 years ago? We should and we do. As mentioned earlier, we find karma 14 and dinosaur bones all the time. And again, anything over 100,000 years of age should have no detectable carbon 14. But it gets better than that. If it's, that seems even possible, it does. Guys, we're finding soft tissue in dinosaur bones still intact all the time now, all over the world and pretty much all the rock layers. Soft, stretchy dinosaur tissue. Oftentimes, blood vessels and red blood cells still intact in that tissue. Like in this Triceratops remnant, this Duckbill dinosaur remnant, or in this T-Rex remnant. They're literally all over the place. And some would say, okay, Brian, but wait. If some dinosaurs were on the ark, well, they got off the ark, and they lived with man post-flood, so shouldn't we find some historical documentation of man with dinosaurs? We should and we do. But remember, the word dinosaur is a new word. Before 1841, these creatures were called something else in pretty much every single culture all around the world. What were they called? Dragons. And guys, these legends are everywhere around the world. And yes, some of them definitely were embellished over time, no doubt. But guys, many of them accurately describe various known types of dinosaurs. And then what happened to the dinosaurs? Well, this is where the talk gets really technical. They died. <laughs> now, why did they die? Well, so many problems they faced post-flood. It's a wrecked world post-flood. Genetic bottleneck of sorts. You're going to have an ice age after a flood. Man hunting them. Lots of problems for dinosaurs post-flood. I got four articles on that online. Of course, videos you might have watched already uh, by, by someone who's taught on this if you want more details on the dinosaurs. But wrapping up with some foundational issues. People say, okay, Brian, you went through all that really quickly. And all that stuff really does seem to confirm the Bible again and again and again. But here's my question. If the evidence is so clear, then how come so many smart people today miss such clear evidence? And the Bible gives an answer to that as well. Because ultimately, we really need to realize this issue, it's not a head issue. It's a heart issue that becomes a worldview issue as a result. It's not an intellect issue. It's a battle over the heart. What do I mean by heart? Not emotions. It's a battle over the will. Either you submit to God or you become your own God. Either God's word is the authority or man's word is. There is no neutral. That's the battle of the heart. Not a head issue. It's a heart issue. I'll give you one more example of this. We'll wrap up. There are canyons on Mars. Evidently bigger than the Grand Canyon, which is really, really fascinating. The question then comes, well, then how long did it take for these canyons to form? Well, according to many secular scientists, like in Scientific America, they said these canyons on Mars, bigger than the Grand Canyon, they formed in just a few weeks. Really? Well, I thought it took millions of years. How in the world did these canyons bigger than the Grand Canyon form in a few weeks, according to their thinking? Here is a direct quote. A flood of biblical proportions carved an instant Grand Canyon on Mars. Guys, they are willing to believe in a flood of biblical proportions on a planet, Mars, with little or no liquid water, but refuse to believe in a flood of biblical proportions on a planet covered by roughly 70% water. The question that probably rings through our minds is how can they be so blind? 
The answer, a PhD, which is not a bad thing, but a PhD does not change a person's heart. Not a head issue, it's a heart issue that becomes a worldview issue. The Bible puts it like this, that the unbeliever suppresses the truth in unrighteousness. It is clear from creation, it's clear from real science, it's clear from our conscience that there's a God. But we suppress that truth in our sinful state. Why? Because we don't want it to be, to be true. Because if God made us, he owns us. We are accountable to him. He judged the world in the past as shown in the fossil record. He'll judge again in the future. And sinful man doesn't like that idea. So we suppress the truth and our righteousness. Ultimately, not a head issue. It's a heart issue. All that being said, how do we use this in our Christian lives? In a couple of different ways. Dear Christian, first, be encouraged. Really be encouraged. What we see in God's world confirms what we read in his word. Your faith is an objective faith that's rooted in something tangible, confirmed again and again and again. Be encouraged in that. Also, be encouraged and challenged to stand on God's word. So many Christians today, so many, are scared or ashamed to trust God's word and stand on that foundation for every issue, whether it's about morality, sexuality, marriage, origins, age of the earth, dinosaurs. They're so ashamed to stand on God's word. Don't be one of those. We're commanded again and again to be, uh, to be full of boldness, to be courageous, to be unashamed in truth and in love and proclaim God's word and proclaim the gospel in clarity. Stand on that foundation. The way we think about the past, the way we live in the present, the way we plan for the future should all be rooted in the tangible reality of God's word given to us as a beautiful gift that we can put our hope in. Now, if you're not a believer, let me encourage you. God's word is true. It's confirmed again and again. Repent and put your faith in Christ alone for salvation. And dear Christian, recognize when we stand on God's word, as a believer, we recognize this, that our weapons to fight against the secular uh, onslaught today and the enemy's attacks today, our weapons are not of flesh. They are divine power. What are our weapons? The power of the spirit and the power of the sword of God, the word of God. That is our divine power. We stand on God's word. And when we stand on God's word, it is then and only then we can destroy the strongholds of the enemy that he's raised up in our culture. These strongholds of a secular ideology, secular morality, evolution, millions of years. There's a strongholds people hide and they get away from the truth of God's word. But through God's word and the spirit, we break down those strongholds. We destroy arguments and lofty opinions raised against the knowledge of God. We destroy those. Why? To unveil the light of the gospel that people might get saved. And we take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. And when we do that, we can proclaim the gospel effectively in a secular day and age like ours. You see, we do apologetics, not simply to win an argument or debate, but rather to defend biblical authority, to proclaim the gospel effectively. As we say again and again, we give answers to proclaim the answer, Jesus Christ, because it is the answer, Jesus Christ, the gospel, that changes the heart, that'll change someone's thinking, that'll change their worldview, that'll change the culture. But it starts with God's word, his gospel, proclaiming that truth and the gospel to God's glory. And now we get equipped to do this. I'm glad you asked that question, all right? Lots of ways to get equipped. Uh, please tune in for all these sessions happening online. Sorry, this one bit, went a bit long, but lots of answers. Not bad for an hour or 10, right? But so many sessions online. Watch these. They're for you guys. Hope they're an encouragement to you. Also, go to our website, answersandgenesis.org. There are literally thousands of great articles, hundreds of videos that you can use for free to equip yourself and those under your care to defend the faith. Get the books and the resources. You might have a little extra time right now. The book, The Lie, Why This Stuff Matters So Much, the foundational textbook of our ministry built on God's Word as to why this is so relevant in our day and age. The answers books one through four. I know I'm biased in this, but I think every home needs to copy these. They are fantastic. Each book answers around 30 different questions, and you get one answer per one chapter. Good, concise, in-depth answer on each of these questions. Answers around 120 of the most asked questions. Books more specific, <clears throat> like on this one, A Flood of Evidence, dealing with geology. Of course, my book, 
from which this talk is based. Quick answers, two tough questions. I cover 33 different answers. Each answer is less than 500 words. As you've heard me say before, these answers are very ADD friendly, good for ages 9 to 90, good for personal study, for family devotions, uh, Sunday school classrooms. I had a friend of mine, uh, someone I met, who's actually using this as part of their Sunday school classroom curriculum, which is awesome. I'd love to see that. And then my brand new book, Quick Answers to Social Issues. How do we as Christians stand on God's word? These are biblical answers, not Brian's. Biblical answers on things like what about social justice, intersectionality, racism, abortion, euthanasia, stem, uh, cloning, stem cell research. What about the sexuality, homosexuality? What about the so-called gay Christians? What about climate change? Good, quick, concise, biblical answers to 37 different questions. Each answer, less than 500 words. All sorts of other great books, Glass House, debunking evolution in, 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 amazing, in amazing ways. What about the age of the earth in more detail? What about genetics? Great book by Dr. Nathaniel Jenton. You might have seen some of his videos recently. I'm showing how real observational science and real study of genetics confirms the Bible again and again. Tons of great stuff for kids, answers for kids. There are phenomenal answer, uh, questions from real kids with a short answer. And then books like N is for Noah, D is for Dinosaur, A is for Adam. Great books presenting biblical history as real and engaging for those younger age groups. Tons of DVDs out there for you guys. If you want to watch all this again, now you can check it out on this DVD. Quick answers to tough questions. Same information, even the same jokes. All right, it's all in there. And then all sorts of other uh, specialty DVDs on genetics and what about the eight men, what about evolution, what about the age of the earth, this and starlight, et cetera, et cetera, all available on the website. And please take advantage of the magazine. It is wonderful. Wins so many awards every single year. They do a great job with the magazine. Comes out bi-monthly. Deals with current biblical authority, Christian worldview issues, really a biblical worldview magazine. There's a kid's section in it. This last one was on the resurrection, perfect for celebrating Easter. My kids and I read through it. It was incredible. Check that out. Really wonderful. You get the digital version for free when you subscribe. And then also recently, we have this promotion going. You can go through our Creation Apologetics Master Class, all six classes. And you can enroll for $19. It's usually a value of roughly $300. A great way to equip yourself and those in your household to know and defend your faith and proclaim the gospel. Please check those out. Then you can sign up for the Answers Insider. Online, get uh, Ken Ham's testimony for free. He's the founder of our ministry. Get that testimony for free. It's a great testimony, by the way. And it gives you a monthly newsletter of what's happening within the ministry. And then keep up with our live programs. If you saw Roger this morning with Dr. Purdom, they were doing some great stuff with burning stuff. It's always fun to play with fire in a controlled environment, right, to show how God's creation screams his glory in so many different ways. So keep up with that each day at 10 o'clock. And then, of course, the 12 o'clock speaker tomorrow is Avery. She's doing a fantastic talk on one blood, one race. You'll love that. Tune in for that. Later on, today at 3, we got animal paintings with camels, snakes, and porcupines. I'm intrigued. I'll see what that's about. At 7 o'clock tonight, Ken's going to be talking with Travis from the design studio, looking at the dioramas used in the Ark Encounter and also the Lucy exhibit. That's fun. It's incredible how they're working that and putting that together, whether, how they're going to use that. So you'll want to tune in for that for sure. And tomorrow, tune in at 10 o'clock for Roger at, with Live Science. Also, if God has just blessed you through this ministry, if you want to help sustain what God is doing here in this tough time for so many people, including our ministry, you can give to Answers in Genesis. You can go there and give any amount, those amounts, less or more, one time, monthly, whatever God's just prodding you to do for his glory, that we can proclaim this message to defend the faith and proclaim the gospel. And if you would like, you can find me later on Facebook or Twitter. Feel free to engage me there. Be glad to help answer any of your questions if I can on those social media platforms. And again, we use all this. We do all these things to give answers, to proclaim the answer. And I'll leave you with one last quote. And we'll wrap up for today. Thanks for your patience, by the way. But a quote often attributed to Martin Luther, but he didn't say this exactly. He says similar things, but this quote is specifically from a hymn writer referencing what Luther went through during the Reformation. Listen to what she says. I think it's very poignant for what we're talking about today. If I profess with the loudest voice and clearest exposition every portion of the truth of God except precisely that little point which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I am not confessing Christ. However boldly, I may be professing Christ. Wherever the battle rages, guys, wherever the battle rages, it is there the loyalty of the soldier is proved. 
And to be steady on the battlefield besides is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that one point where the battle's happening today. Let's recognize where that battle is happening. Let's stand firm on God's word. Let's not flinch, but stand on that foundation, defend the faith, and proclaim the gospel unashamedly, boldly, lovingly to his glory and for our joy and good. You guys have a wonderful day. Talk to you later on.